In this tutorial, we're going to look at the menstrual cycle. So the first thing is, can you describe the four key stages of the menstrual cycle? Can you explain how hormones control the menstrual cycle? And can you evaluate the pros and cons of the many different fertility treatments on the market? I've put a picture of the moon up here because the lunar cycle is 28 days and coincidentally so is the menstrual cycle. For that reason, some people believe there's a sort of spiritual link between the lunar cycle and the menstrual cycle. So the menstrual cycle involves two things. Firstly, ovulation. This is when an egg cell is released from the ovaries. And secondly, the development and breakdown of the lining of the uterus. You can see this pinkish area here, that represents the uterus lining or the endometrium. And what will happen is throughout the menstrual cycle, it will start to build up and then wear away and then shed completely. So there are four key stages to the menstrual cycle. Remember, it's a 28 day cycle, but we start with day one. Day one is when the uterus lining breaks down when this happens, we call it menstruation. So that's when the uterine lining sheds and you would commonly call it a period. The next stage occurs at around day four. And this is when the uterine lining starts to build up again. As you can see here, it's starting to thicken again. A very significant event occurs at day 14. And that is when an egg cell is released from one of the ovaries. This is called ovulation. And between days 14 and 28, the uterus lining thickness is maintained. So you can see we have this constant level of thickness there. So the point of the menstrual cycle is to prepare the female's body for pregnancy, for reproduction, but also to save energy in case reproduction opportunities do not arise. So basically, the egg starts its journey in the ovary and will make its way down the fallopian tube. The sperm will actually meet the egg in the fallopian tube or the oviduct and that is where fertilization occurs and then the fertilized egg will sort of carry on down here and it will implant itself onto this soft cushion which is the uterine lining and there there'll be lots of blood vessels to feed it with nutrients it needs to develop and grow. And those are the four key stages of the menstrual cycle. So now let's look at how hormones control the menstrual cycle. There are four hormones that you need to know. The first is FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, and that does exactly what it says it does. It stimulates the development of one egg cell, and it will be released from the part of the endocrine system called the pituitary gland found in the brain. So the pituitary gland secretes or releases FSH. Next up is estrogen. Estrogen is released from the ovaries. It's also released from the cluster of cells that surround the egg cell. The main job of oestrogen is to build up the lining of the uterus so that it becomes nice and thick and like a big cushion to receive the fertilized egg. Then we have luteinizing hormone or LH for you and that's also released from the pituitary gland and that basically stimulates the process of ovulation when the egg cell is released from the ovaries. Finally, we have progesterone, and progesterone is released from a structure which is created when the egg cell is released from the ovaries. You get this kind of withered, dying cluster of cells called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum, or the cells that make it up, release progesterone for a short time. So now let's look at how these four hormones play off against each other to coordinate the menstrual cycle. So in this diagram, like before, you can see the uterine lining getting thinner and thicker as we go through the cycle. You can also see how the egg cell changes as we go through the cycle. And I'm also going to be adding how the levels of each hormone change throughout the cycle. Remember to watch the color key here. Okay, so we start off with follicle stimulating hormone, which remember is secreted by the pituitary gland. So FSH brings about the egg maturation in one ovary. In other words, one egg starts to develop, at least one egg starts to develop in the ovary. Um, it also stimulates the ovaries to produce another hormone called estrogen, but we'll get to that in a second. So this is how the levels of FSH change throughout the menstrual cycle. It slowly starts to increase, and as it gets to day 14, you get spike, and then it starts to stay sort of more or less the same for the rest of the cycle, maybe going down a bit. So as I said, FSH will stimulate the production of estrogen from the ovaries. And estrogen's job is to 
basically increase the thickness of the lining. It also stimulates the release of another hormone called LH and will inhibit FSH, so it will actually cause FSH to go down slightly. So estrogen starts below FSH, and as FSH is released and stimulates the ovaries to produce more, the levels of estrogen rise. Just before day 14, before ovulation, the levels drop, but there is a second sort of spike uh, between days 14 and 28. So I said that estrogen basically stimulates the release from, of LH from the pituitary gland, and here we have LH in play. LH only does one thing of particular interest. Basically, it does nothing and nothing, and it continues to do nothing. And then just before day 14, it goes crazy, and then it goes back to doing nothing, 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 nothing. And so uh, the real significance of it, obviously, if you haven't figured it out, is for ovulation. So LH is directly linked to ovulation. When there's a surge of it, it stimulates the ovaries to release that egg cell. Finally, we have progesterone, and that also maintains the thickness of the uterine wall, the lining, and it inhibits LH because obviously you don't want to ovulate constantly. So progesterone, again, doesn't do much for most of the cycle, but basically after day 14, it will start to rise, it will become quite high levels, and it will be inhibiting LH, and then it will start to basically decrease. Now, I think it's important that we pay attention to these pictures up here and link them to the hormones. So remember, first we start off with FSH from the pituitary gland, and that stimulates the development of an egg cell. The egg cells and the ovaries will start to produce estrogen, and estrogen will basically cause the lining to build up. Around day 14, just before in fact, we have a surge of LH, and that stimulates ovulation, the release of an egg cell from the ovaries. After the egg cell's been released, we're left with this kind of withered structure called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum produces progesterone over here. And the progesterone will maintain the thickness of the lining, but if no fertilized egg cell comes, the corpus luteum starts to wither away. And so there are less cells that are able to be produce progesterone, so the levels go down. Just a quick recap as to what controls what. Remember that FSH in yellow stimulates the production of estrogen. Estrogen, however, will inhibit the production of FSH. And this is going to be very important when we look at birth control in a second. Estrogen will stimulate the production of LH and progesterone will inhibit the production of LH. In fact, estrogen and progesterone will inhibit these two hormones. And that is how you can explain how hormones control the menstrual cycle. So our knowledge of hormones is very important in developing fertility treatments. So let's evaluate the pros and cons of various fertility treatments. So firstly, we can actually use estrogen and progesterone as a contraceptive pill. We also refer to it as the combined pill. And that will lower your fertility. Now, if you remember from the previous slide, why that is, is because estrogen and progesterone will inhibit FSH and LH. So if you remember, that means that you're not going to get eggs maturing and you're not going to get eggs being ovulated. So if those two events don't happen, there's nothing to fertilize. So there's no pregnancy. It takes a little bit of time to kick in, but once it does, it's incredibly effective at preventing pregnancy. So the obvious pros are it's 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. It is also linked to reducing the risk of developing certain cancers linked to hormone levels in the female body. Now let's look at the cons. There's a small chance of it not working as a contraceptive, but very, very small, so it's not a significant con. Secondly, it can have some bad side effects on certain females, which include symptoms such as sickness, headaches, and irregular bleeding. Um, also, it does not offer any protection against STDs, or sexually transmitted diseases. Taking FSH can also be used as a fertility treatment, well, to increase fertility this time. Obviously, it's called follicle-stimulating hormone, so the more eggs that start to mature in the ovary, the greater chance you have of becoming pregnant. So an obvious advantage is it helps many people who couldn't previously get pregnant. However, it doesn't always work, and repeating it can be very expensive. And also there's a chance, because multiple eggs are developing, uh, of multiple pregnancies such as twins and triplets, and some parents might not want that. Finally, we have in vitro fertilization, or IVF. This is becoming very common as people are starting to have babies later in life, where perhaps they're not as biologically capable. 
Now, during IVF, the female will be given fertility drugs to, like FSH, to, so she starts producing more and more eggs. These eggs will then be fertilized by the male sperm outside of the body, so in a lab, let's say in a Petri dish. Once the egg cells start to develop into a small cluster of cells called embryos, they are implanted back into the uterus, where hopefully at least one of them will develop into a fetus. So the obvious pro to this is that it helps infertile couples have children. However, women can have bad reactions to these hormones. It's rare, but it can happen, just like I mentioned above here. So when you're taking LH and FSH, it can cause things like headaches and uh, severe bleeding and so on. In fact, it can increase the chances of miscarriage as well. There is some data to suggest that it increases the chance of developing certain cancers, but it's all very controversial, and there is some data to actually prove the contrary case as well. There's also the chance of multiple births, so that presents the same problem as the previous con. So that's a complete table that summarises the pros and cons of fertility treatments. So that is how you can evaluate the pros and cons of different fertility treatments.